I think the first prayer that I ever learned as a child was the simple table grace that my grandmother taught me, and I think every child in America learns it at one time or another, and it goes like this, God is great, God is good, and we thank Him for this food. I don't know who first composed that prayer, but I think the prayer somehow was supposed to rhyme. And when my grandmother said it, it did rhyme. She said, God is great, God is good, and we thank Him for this food. And <laughs> I always thought that was strange, and she called that thing that was on top of our house uh, the roof. And uh, that's just a, a different generation. But like many children, I memorized that table grace and would say it uh, by rote without any uh, deep meaning or appreciation for the words I was expressing. And it wasn't, of course, until many, many years later when I became a serious student of theology that I discovered that the two uh, attributes of God that were contained in that child's prayer, God is great and God is good, that both of these concepts, the greatness of God and the goodness of God, are subsumed in one single word in sacred Scripture. And that word that captures both of these concepts in one word is the word holy. I want to take a minute to uh, explain that because we don't normally think of the word holy uh, to refer to two different things. I think the standard accepted understanding of the term holy in Scripture is that word, that uh, meaning that we ascribe to God whereby we refer to God's purity, that the holiness of God expresses His absolutely perfect purity, in which there's no shadow of turning within Him, no blemish on His character, and so on. And certainly, if we look at the, the lexicons of biblical words, we will see under the word holy that the secondary meaning of the term is purity. But the primary meaning of the term holy in sacred Scripture refers to God's otherness, the sense in which He is different from everything in creation. The holiness of God directs our attention to His transcendent, august majesty, so that when we say that He is holy, we're not only saying that He is pure, we're not only saying simply that He is good, but we are saying that He is great. In fact, that's the primary reference to the Word. But <clears throat> what we're concerned about in this session is not so much His greatness for the moment, but rather we're concerned for His goodness. And I want us to think this through a little bit and ask the question together, what do we mean when we say that God is good? In what sense can it be said of God that He is good? I think we know that the Scriptures teach that God is the source, the fountainhead of all goodness and that there is uh, an inseparable uh, bond and relationship between our understanding of goodness and our understanding of God. Even the ancient Greek philosophers, for example, Aristotle and Plato, saw a link between goodness and God. Aristotle, in trying to define ethics, understood that for any uh, ethical system to mean anything, there has to be a standard for goodness. Acts and ideas and principles can only be deemed to be good or bad according to some standard. 
And if the standard is a constantly sliding, shifting, relativistic norm, we can never know for sure whether something is good or not. And so Aristotle sought for what he called the summum bonum, the highest good. And he linked that with the ultimate being. Plato called God the idea of the good. Now again, in theology, one of the great uh, debates historically has been how does God relate to the concept of the good? Is there some kind of standard for goodness that is independent from God? Is there a law, for example, that defines goodness that is over God and by which God is judged? Technically, we ask in theology, is God sub lego? Is God under law? Is there some cosmic law of goodness that even God is required to obey? Or is God outside of law, apart from law? Is he, again, as the theologians say, ex lex, not ex lax, ex lex, outside of the law? Well, both ideas that God is under some independent standard that exists outside of him, or that God is a maverick to the law, uh, accountable to nothing, sort of free to act in any arbitrary, whimsical, capricious uh, way that he so pleases. Both of those concepts have been categorically rejected by Orthodox Christianity. And the biblical concept is this, that there is a law of goodness that even God must obey and by which God himself is judged. And that goodness, however, is not something apart from him, but the ultimate norm for goodness, the standard of goodness itself, is the eternal character of God himself. When we say that God is a law unto himself, we mean that God always acts and behaves according to his nature, according to his own character. And that character is altogether holy. That character is altogether righteous. One more technical distinction, then I'm going to make it simple. In theology, we distinguish between the justitia interna and the justitia externa of God. That is, the internal righteousness of God and the external righteousness of God. That distinction, in simple terms, simply means this, that what God does externally is always perfectly consistent with what he is internally. His behavior is pure because his being is pure. There is a consistency between the fruit and the tree. Now, the goodness of God has been disputed by many people and in many ways and on many occasions. The philosopher John Stuart Mill, for example, said, that Christianity and Judaism together both teach that God is all-powerful and all-good. And Mill's criticism was this, that Christianity wants to have its cake and eat it too, that both of these propositions cannot be equally true. And the reason for the protest of John Stuart Mill was this, that Mill looked at a world that is filled with pain, with suffering, with grief, and with evil. 
And he says, if God is all-powerful and allows the pain that you know and that you experience, the suffering that has afflicted you, if God is all-powerful and allows the degree of evil that casts a shadow over the joy of human life, then he cannot possibly be good. But if God is indeed altogether good, and yet we still find this problem of pain, of suffering, and of evil in the world, then the only explanation we can give is that God is powerless to overcome the grief and the pain and the evil that is so much a part of our lives. In other words, if evil is here, then God must be either not omnipotent or not benevolent. He can't be both powerful and good and have a mess like this on his hands. Of course, the one thing that Professor Mill overlooked was the concept of justice. If God is all good and all powerful and he is just and man violates that justice and God did not visit this planet with affliction and with judgment, then we could say God is not good. You see, the unspoken assumption is that God somehow is morally responsible to give nothing but blessing to rebellious members of his creation. But if a God gave nothing but blessing to cosmic traitors, then God could hardly be thought to be good at all. This problem was wrestled with early on in Old Testament history. We see it graphically in the book of Genesis in the 18th chapter. And this is the account of Abraham interceding for the judgment that God threatens against the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's look at the text and see uh, the essence of the story. Verse 20 of chapter 18 says this, And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. Let's get that established. God looked at Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities that since their existence and destruction have come to be symbolic of all that is evil in the world. But God evaluated Sodom and Gomorrah, and he not only found wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah, not only was that wickedness deemed by the judge of heaven and earth to be a serious evil, Again, the language here is a grave wickedness, but grave to the superlative degree. Their wickedness was exceedingly grave. Unspeakably corrupt was the judgment of God. And so God makes this pronouncement, I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry which has come to me, and if not, I will know. And then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. And Abraham came near, and he said to God, Wilt thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Do you get the question? God is threatening to rain down judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham has friends that live there. And he said, God, what are you going to do? Are you going to destroy innocent people? Are you going to punish the innocent, the righteous, along with the wicked? Now, I know that <clears throat> Abraham did not have the benefit of New Testament theology. Abraham did not have the benefit of a contemporary seminary education. But Abraham is considered the father of the faithful in sacred scripture, 
And we would expect that a man as close to God, a man as knowledgeable of the character of God as Abraham was, would have bitten his tongue before he asked such an insulting question of the Almighty. Abraham suggests the possibility of the unthinkable when he says to God, God, are you going to destroy the innocent with the wicked? And if ever was a theological lapse by a giant of the faith, here it was. Abraham stuck his foot in his mouth big time with that question. Wouldn't it be fundamentally unjust for God to indiscriminately punish innocent people with guilty people? I remember when I was a child and went to school that one of the things I had real problems with with the teachers were some of the disciplinary tactics that I experienced in school disciplinary tactics that were effective. I have to admit that. I remember one time David King, one of the kids in our class, set off a cherry bomb in the middle of study period when the teacher had her back turned. And in a classroom with closed windows and wooden floors, when a cherry bomb goes off, uh, you know, that is a big noise. And a poor Miss Husk, you know, uh, broke the Guinness Book of Records for the high jump when that uh, when that cherry bomb went off, and of course she turned around and she was furious, and she didn't know who had set off the cherry bomb. And just like Captain Quigg and his strawberries, you know, she says, all right, all right, who did it? And everybody sits there like this, nobody volunteers, nobody confesses to the crime. And she said, I'll wait for the culprit to confess. And the culprit wouldn't confess. And so this was the punishment she dished out. She said, all right, this whole class will stay after school until somebody tells me who did this. Now, obviously, more people knew who the guilty party was besides David King. But everybody that was sitting in front of David King, the moment the cherry bomb was released, had no idea. Well, I shouldn't say they had no idea. Anybody in that classroom could have guessed who would set off the cherry bomb <laughs> because they knew David King, and I'm sure Miss Hosko swat him as her prime suspect. But these people didn't know. They were innocent. And yet she punished the innocent with the guilty until somebody confessed. Ladies and gentlemen, that was effective, but that taught me a lesson about injustice. My teacher communicated to me that she was not concerned about justice because she was willing to punish the innocent with the guilty. We do that in human society. God will not do that. And Abraham certainly should have known that. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose, God, there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Oh, finally, Abraham benefits from the philosophy of a sec second glance. He takes a deeper breath and comes to his senses. Now he begins to talk like the hero of the faith that we know that he is. He says in verse 25, Far be it from thee to do such a thing to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from thee. Oh, Abraham, good for you. The only problem is, Abraham, you don't have any idea how far it would be from God to do such a dreadful thing. And then Abraham utters another rhetorical question. And this is a, a, prof a profoundly important verse. Listen. The last part of verse 25. Shall not the judge of all of the earth do what is right? 
that is the prime assumption of the biblical concept of God and his justice. That this is one judge, the supreme judge, the judge of heaven and the earth. Shall he not do what is right? Ladies and gentlemen, that's all God knows how to do because he is altogether righteous. And to be righteous, simply speaking, is to do what is right. God always does what is right. And Abraham understood that. And that was the foundation for this uh, almost humorous narrative of negotiations. Listen to how it goes. He says, so the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. Do you hear what he's saying here? God is saying, not only will I never, ever, 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 ever punish the innocent with the wicked, but I'll, I'm even willing to be gracious to the wicked for the sake of the innocent. If you can find if I can find 50 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll save the whole city. How's that, Abraham? Abraham said, that's great. And Abraham said, but now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Uh, suppose the 50 are lacking but five. Wilt thou destroy the whole city because of those five? In other words, God... If I can only find 45, will you still be merciful? God said, okay, I'll save the city if you can find 45. And Abraham spoke to him again and said, excuse me, suppose 40 are found there. God said, I won't do it on account of the 40. Then Abraham said, <clears throat> uh, may the Lord not be angry and I shall speak. Suppose 30 are found there. God said, I won't do it if I find 30. Abraham said once more, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found. God said, I will not destroy it on account of the 20. And he said, please, may the Lord not be angry, and I shall speak only this once more. Suppose 10 are found there, and God said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned to his place. And you know the end of the story. Even armed with the lamp of Diogenes, God couldn't find ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the judgment of the Lord fell upon those cities. Will not the judge of all of the earth do what is right? Far be it from him ever to punish the innocent with the guilty. A few years ago, a book was written by a rabbi in America that became a runaway bestseller and catapulted this man into national fame and prominence. He's on every talk show because he addressed an issue that is a sore point with people. And the name of his book was When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Do you remember that? When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Basically, Rabbi Kushner was addressing this question, why is it that we see so many bad things happen to good people? In simple terms, this was the question John Stuart Mill was wrestling with centuries ago. Why does a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? Oh, how I wish my publisher would have asked me to write that book, because it would have been the easiest book I would have ever undertaken to write. If my publisher said, R.C., we want you to write a book entitled, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, I could finish the task in less than a minute. I would title the book, 
why bad things happen to good people. And then I'd pick up my pen and I would write on the page, they don't. <laughs> that would be the end. <laughs> my magnum opus, <laughs> shortest book I've ever done. They don't. Bad things don't happen to good people. Because the Bible makes it very clear that there is none righteous, no, not one, that judged by the ultimate standard of God's goodness, it is a misnomer to credit humanity with the epitaph, good. Do you remember the rich young ruler that rushed to the feet of Jesus, saying to him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus stopped him in his tracks and said, hey, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Okay. Now we can say, relatively speaking, we know that some people are more wicked than other people, and the, even the psalmist in the ancient world asked the question, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Why does it seem that the scales of justice in this world of sinners, even in this world of sinners, is out of whack? That there are some people that are ruthless and cruel and corrupt, and they, uh, they make their way to fame and fortune over a, a, a group of bodies that are strewn in their wake, and they seem to prosper. Whereas people who are trying, relatively speaking, to be conscientious and, and unselfish and helpful to their neighbor are trampled down. We live in a topsy-turvy world where princes walk in rag, rags and beggars ride on horseback. That's the question, really, that is being addressed here when we say, why do bad things happen to good people? Now, I've answered part of the question by saying, ultimately, there are no good people. But what I'm about to get into now, I think you may find shocking, and I'll ask you to put yourself on, on, on shockproof control for a few moments until I finish this, lest you become so shocked with what I'm about to say that uh, you won't even hear the explanation of it. Suppose, in your wildest imagination in your dreams, that Jesus walked in here right now and came up to you and looked you in the eye and said, I'm going to make a promise to you that for the rest of your days in this world, I'm not going to allow anything bad to happen to you that all that's going to happen to you for the rest of your days will be good. How would you feel about that? You know, that's one of the reasons I can't wait to get to heaven, because the Bible tells us that there's no evil in heaven. There's no pain in heaven. There's no cancer in heaven. There's no suffering in heaven. There's no death in heaven. There aren't even any tears in heaven. And this world in which I live now, there is suffering, there is evil, there is pain, there's cancer, there's emotional distress, there's loneliness. I remember when I was a little boy and I would go out and I would get hurt and I would experience pain, either emotional pain, somebody would tease me or make fun of me or or exclude me from a game and hurt my feelings, or if I fall down and hit my head on a rock and my head would be bleeding, and I would run home crying, crocodile tears pouring down my cheeks, and how my mother would meet me in the kitchen and she'd have her apron on, and she would hug me, and, and I would be sobbing, and, and, and you know how little kids, after they're done crying, they, they can't breathe, they're gasping, and I would be gasping like that, and those tears would still be there, and she would take the corner of her apron, and she would stoop over, and she would wipe away my tears. That's one of the tenderest things that any human being can do for another person, huh? To wipe away their tears. And it was comforting. It brought me consolation. 
And any time pain happened and she wasn't there, I'm like any other kid in history, my first cry was, I want my mommy. Well, because my mommy was the one who could, miss, could kiss it and make it go away, make it all better. But when my mom dried away my tears, they would come back. The Bible says that in heaven, God is going to wipe away our tears. And when God wipes away our tears, it's the end of tears. We will never weep again from grief or sorrow or sadness. And so on the one hand, we know that we are living in a world that the Bible describes as a veil of tears. Huh? And so we really don't expect Jesus to walk in here and say to us, Whatever happens, you know, only good is going to come to pass in your life for the rest of your day. Now, here comes the shock. Are you ready? We don't need to have Jesus walk in the room and say to us that the only thing that is ever going to happen to you for the rest of your life are good things, because he's already said it. Let me say it again. We don't have to fantasize about Jesus walking in here and saying to you personally, I have to qualify it, if you're a Christian. We don't have to fantasize God coming here and saying to you who are a believer, who are a Christian, that nothing bad will ever happen to you the rest of your life on this planet because he's already said it. You say, are you out of your mind, R.C. Sproul? Are you crazy? In like manner, God has already said in so many words to the unbeliever, nothing that ever happens to you will be good. Everything that happens to you will be a tragedy. Is that shocking? Let me explain it. I know it's shocking. And you know that the Bible says, be careful of people and flee from people who have the audacity to call good evil or evil good. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make a distinction here that the Bible makes between what I'm going to call the proximate and the ultimate. The proximate is that which is here in this proximity. It is close at hand. It is near. It is part of our experience. I'm referring to the human level of things, the earthly level, the horizontal plane in which we live every day. On that plane, on the proximate plane of human existence, we deal with bad things every day. Sin is bad. Pain is bad. Suffering is bad. The death of a loved one is tragic to us. And the Bible doesn't try to sugarcoat that. And the Bible doesn't try to say that evil is simply an illusion. And you have to pretend that it doesn't exist. No, 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 no. It strongly affirms the stark, naked reality of pain and suffering, affliction and grief and tribulation. And the Bible says, in the world you will have tribulation. Huh? But a verse in Scripture that uh, has been voted as the most popular verse in the New Testament among Christians is Romans 8.28. What does Romans 8.28 say? Let me read it for you briefly. And we know, do we? That's apostolic optimism. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to, are those, to those who are called according to His purpose. We all know that verse, don't we? All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and who are called according to His purpose. You memorized that years ago, right? Well, at first blush, that seems to say to us, okay, there are all kinds of things in the proximate realm that happen to us that are bad. But God stands over and above that proximate realm. God is on the vertical plane. 
transcending this horizontal veil of tears in which we live, and he has the power to take every bad thing that happens to you and make it contribute ultimately to your good, doesn't he? Isn't that what that verse is saying? Well, think about it for a minute. If ultimately all of these proximate miseries and tragedies and griefs and sufferings and bad things that we experience are taking place, if ultimately God is using these things to bring them about for good, then QED, ladies and gentlemen, ultimately, ultimately, it is good that they have happened to us. Do you see that? Ultimately, it is good that they happen to us. That the Heavenly Father never allows anything to happen to you that is not for your ultimate good. If we could believe that, we could face anything. I wrote a book on suffering called Surprised by Suffering. I chose that title on purpose because in this day and age there's a, a brand of Christianity that I believe is a serious distortion of biblical Christianity that goes about the world teaching people that God only wills health and prosperity for people. And that all of the sorrow and the pain and the grief and death and all of that is a result of the devil's work among us. As if the devil had the power ultimately to frustrate the sovereign authority of God. I listened to a talk show one day where the, the minister on television was interviewing a couple that had gone through a serious tragedy. Their child had been killed or something. And and they were trying to be heroic in their Christian testimony and say, even though, you know, it's like Job, though he slays me, yet will I trust him. And they were going through all these things, and they said they still trust God in spite of this dreadful calamity that had befallen them. And the pastor was trying to comfort them, and he said, we know that God doesn't have anything to do with death, that God has nothing to do with suffering. That, that's basically the idea that Rabbi Kushner is saying. That Kushner is saying God's not responsible for the pain and the sorrow and the affliction and suffering and death in this world. He'd like to be able to help out, but the universe is structured in such a way as the deity's hands are tied. He's merely a, a, a grieving spectator of the whole mess. But as I watched that program and I listened to that pastor say, God has nothing whatsoever to do with death. I wanted to scream. God has everything to do with death. Now, I understand, friends, that the pastor was trying to bring comfort. He didn't want the people to be blaming God for the sin, for the sorrow, for the grief, for the disease and suffering and death. And so they were trying to absolve God for any blame so that we would think well of God and bringing comfort. But if the person thought that through, they would realize that that's like an empty cloud. That a God who has nothing whatsoever to do with death is no comfort whatsoever to me. The message of the Bible is, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. God majors in suffering. He redeems the world through suffering. The pathway of our Lord is the Via Dolorosa, the road of grief. It is through suffering that our redemption is accomplished, beloved. God majors in suffering. And to say that He has nothing to do with it is to take all hope away from us. I wrote a book entitled Surprised by Suffering, I, I, as I said, and I used that, that, that title because 
people have come to believe this idea that God has nothing to do with suffering. And so, when Christians experience grief, when the doctor tells the Christian that they have terminal cancer, when the policeman comes to the door of your home in the middle of the night and tells you that your child has just been killed in a traffic accident, that's suffering. And we're shocked. And we're surprised. This shouldn't be happening to me. I'm a Christian. But what does the Bible say? Think it not strange. When you are visited with manifold afflictions. The Bible never promises that Christians will not suffer. Ladies and gentlemen, if you just read it once, you'll see that the Bible promises that we will suffer. But with that promise is the promise of God's triumph in our suffering, God's triumph over our suffering, God's triumph through our suffering, God working over and above. This ultimate should be re reversed and put up here in control over the proximate so that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and who are called according to His purpose. In that book, Surprised by Suffering, I have a chapter that I've had, I don't know how many radio interviews about this chapter. Everybody that wants to ask me about this book, ask me about this chapter. And the chapter is entitled, I think it's titled, the theme of the chapter is Suffering as a Vocation. As a vocation. You know, when I took my vocational counseling examination and my multiple uh, choice career option survey, suffering wasn't one of the things that I checked. What do you mean suffering is a vocation? What I mean is this, that in everybody's life, at some point, the call of God, and that's what a vocation is, a call, the call of God on your life is to suffer. Bob Greasy's in the Hall of Fame, standing quarterback, Super Bowl champion, Miami Dolphins. His wife endured the lingering death from cancer in which she suffered for 10 years as a Christian. I was in their home towards the end of that experience. And I sat with Judy Greasy and held her hands as she wept and she said to me, R.C., I can't take any more. I just can't. Where's God? What could I say to her? You know, God works all things together. Be of good cheer. No. I just said, Judy, I don't know what to say. Three days later, she died. And on that day, she was cured of her cancer. As she went to be with the Lord. I don't know what God's purpose was in that. But it was holy. And I know if the doctor tells me that I'm going to have to spend several years in agony and in torture, I'm not looking forward to that. I don't want to ever hear that. I hope that I can die in my sleep. I hope that I can be spared so much of the pain and the anguish that is a normal lot of the human race. But the last thing that I ever want to hear, ladies and gentlemen, if I am stricken with a dreadful disease, is that my suffering is for nothing. That it happens by chance. That I'm just an unfortunate accident victim. I know if I'm going to, if I ever have to face that, that the only way I'll be able to get through it is to go to God and say, God, I don't know why 
you have visited me with this. But if this is your call on my life, then I'll be able to survive it. I'll be able to endure it. Because if I know that it is God's purpose for me to do it, then I'll know that the reason for it, beloved, is altogether good. Now, I said in passing that every tragedy for the Christian is ultimately a blessing. That doesn't deny the reality of the tragedy at this level. But ultimately, every tragedy in your life is a blessing. And every blessing that the pagan receives from the hand of God for which that pagan does not respond in gratitude and repentance before God increases his guilt before God. Every good and perfect gift that God gives to an unbeliever that that unbeliever refuses to praise God for becomes an occasion for judgment ultimately. So that ultimately all of those blessings are tragedies for the one who does not repent. But again, for the one who loves God, for the one who has a vocation, for the one who is called according to his purpose. Everything, everything works together for good. For will not the judge of all of the earth do what is right?